Welcome to the BYU Library Family History Webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on August 17th with Maureen Brady. She will be giving a presentation entitled Northwest Researching the Great Lakes States. Um, if you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation entitled, How Did You Find That? Tips for Searching Family Search Historical Records. Before we begin, here's a little bit about Catherine. After years on the sidelines, Catherine began doing family history. Somewhat to her surprise, she discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library and presents at other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. In addition, she's a regular contributor to the Family Search blog. Catherine works as a technical writer and instructional designer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Her current work assignment includes developing training used on mobile devices. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and fresh raspberries. And we'll now turn the time over to Catherine if she's ready. Okay, can you guys see the screen okay? If you cannot, please put something in the chat so we can get it fixed. But as a lot of you know, I see a lot of people who are back. Thanks, David. David says it's good in the chat. He can see it. So I'm assuming everybody else can too. So as a lot of you know who come to these webinars, a lot of times I'll start out a webinar by saying, I am so excited about this class. Well, I have to admit to you, <laughs> I was actually not very excited for, at first to do this class just because I sometimes find searching so dang frustrating. And as I was trying to make the slide deck for this webinar, I kept thinking, oh my goodness, you know, how do I make this simple instead of complicated? And how do I not be frustrated about this? Because if I'm frustrated, it'll come across frustrating to everybody else. So this is just a little moment of honesty here. But I have to tell you that after I worked through everything, I actually am excited about this webinar. I hope that it will be very helpful to you and would love to get your feedback on it for future improvements. But with all that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. So this webinar will focus specifically on searching family searches, historical records, not other websites. But some of the principles that we'll talk about today can definitely be applied to other websites. So let's start out by highlighting an important truth, and that is that searching for information about our families in trustworthy records really is integral to building our family tree. We can't really build a good tree, at least not beyond our immediate generations, without looking in historical records. And let's be honest, as human beings, there's a part of us that loves to search for things. So we play games about searching, right? We go on scavenger hunts. Some people do geocaching. My sister and her husband love to do that. We can challenge ourselves with escape rooms. That's kind of a current trend. Think of our entertainment. We read books and we watch shows about search adventures. Anything that is searching for a goal or like a mystery, a Sherlock Holmes mystery, whatever, people are always searching for information or for who did the crime or whatever. As human beings, we seem to be wired in a way to enjoy searching. So if that's the case, then why are we so often intimidated or even frustrated when we search for historical records in the context of doing family history? 
Well, as I thought, you guys could probably share a lot of reasons. And as I thought about my own experience, I kind of came up with two reasons. See if you can relate to this. Sometimes, to be honest, we just have no clue how to do the search or even where to search. So that kind of black box feeling where we, we feel like we're up against a total unknown is unnerving and we a lot of times don't even know how to break through that that wall, if you will, of how to even figure out where we're supposed to start. The other thing is sometimes we may know what we're looking for, and we may have even had experience in the past of searching certain records, so we know something should be there, like a christening record or a marriage record, a birth registration. We have reason to believe it's there, and yet, despite our best efforts, we cannot find it. And that can be equally challenging. So the goal of today's webinar is to provide strategies and examples to help with these types of challenges so that we all have more success in doing our searching. So with that as a backdrop, we've got three things on the agenda today. First, we'll talk about how we can prepare to have an effective search. Then we'll go over some search basics, including examples. And then finally, we'll talk about some ways to handle results, the search results. OK, let's dive into our first topic, preparing to search. This is probably one that doesn't get as much attention as it should. So the first step in doing a good search is actually not to do the search, but to review what you've already got. And almost always, it's more than we think we have, right? I will look at stuff, I'll go, oh, I don't have anything. And then I'll start looking in Family Tree or I'll look at my research notes and I'll say, wait a second, I've got a little more here than I realized I did. So it's always a good idea if you're searching in Family Search historical records to see what you've already got in Family Tree about that person or that family or see what else somebody else may have entered about that family. The next thing, which is very important, is to sanity check it. Does it look reasonably accurate or do you see some red flags that might need to be addressed before you do the search? And I'm going to give an example in just a second. Do And the last thing is, do you have additional information such as maybe research logs or notes or a friend you can talk to or anything that might give you any extra information or context that you need for doing that search. The truth is it's hard to get where you want to go if you don't know where you are. The thing is, so often in searching, we tend to just head off almost as if we didn't it didn't realize maybe how important it is to establish what we've already got before we move on to finding more information. So here's an example that happened to me actually just a few days ago. So I was working on my Lily line. For those friends who have been in our webinars for a while, you know that I'm always working on my Bescoby line and the Lilies married into the Bescoby line. So I was working on this record of John Lilly and I noticed that he, he didn't have any relationships in family tree. Excuse me, let me clarify. He had parents and siblings, but no spouse and no children. And then I noticed, well, he's got a death date here and he wasn't really that old when he died. So maybe he just didn't marry. So I looked to see if there were any sources. You see right here, zero sources. So I have no substantiation, but I've done a lot of research in the tiny parish of Cranwell in Lincolnshire, and they have very good records available online. So I thought if he really died about 1866 in Cranwell, it should be reasonably simple to find a burial record. Well, a very careful, thorough search for death and burial records found nothing, no supporting sources. In fact, there was there were no John Lilies that might even have been a faint possibility. There was like nothing. Not only that, I started to look, well, maybe he lived past 1866 and someone got confused with the death date or whatever. I could not find this guy after 1841 in the census, no trace of him. If he had lived to 1866, you would expect him to be in later censuses like the 1851 or the 1861. There was not a trace of him. 
then this underscores a point that embarrassingly, embarrassingly I've made before that it always pays to look at the research you've already done. I had this faint memory that I probably had worked on this family quite a while ago. So I went to my Google Drive and guess what I found? There was a timeline grid. For those of you who have been to class before, you know that that's a, right, a lightweight research log. And here's a link. We can add a link to this to the presentation or on this slide deck. If you open it up, we'll give a link to the slide deck at the end. And if you open it up and come to this slide, this link works. It'll take you to information. Anyway, I found my old timeline grid and discovered that I had reason to believe that he and his family had moved to the United States and that he had married. I even had a possible wife's name. Well, that would explain why I didn't find him dead and buried in Cranwell in 1866. So now I have a better idea of where to search. I won't be up against this brick wall looking for a death record in Cranwell that probably isn't there. So this is a good example of why it's so important to kind of look at the information you already have, sanity check it, make sure you're on firm footing before you start to search for further information. The next step after you've done your, your basic um, sanity checking and reviewing is to choose a doable goal. So specific goals tend to be better. For example, look for John Lilly in the U.S. 1870 census. That's a very specific goal. It's going to help me focus my efforts. That's a lot better than something like figure out what happened to John Lilly. Does that make sense? So the broader the goal is, oftentimes the harder it's going to be to focus specifically and find success. Now, the next tip, I owe a big shout out to my friend, Heather McPhee. Some of you might recognize her. She's um, active in online communities, a very, just a beautiful person, very humble, but also very talented with family history. And she likes to recommend that people ask the question before they search, how are you going to recognize if you found the correct information. Well, here are some thoughts about that. The way we recognize deceased people is not the same as living people, right? Living people, we could recognize them by their appearance, by the sound of their voice, by where they live, by their occupation, maybe we work with them. But for deceased people, we have to go by facts that are on historical records, such as a name, vital events, birth, marriage, and death, their occupation, that's often documented, and also their relationships that are documented, such as their parents, siblings, spouses, and children. So on a search result, the more items that match the information you already know, the more you can trust that the result is correct. Learn to recognize when you don't really have proof that the search result is about the person. One of the mistakes that I used to make as a new family historian and that I've often seen other new family historians make is that they believe that if the name and the place are correct and maybe the birth year, that it's got to be the same person. But so often, just a name and a location is not enough. We want to get as many items matching as we can to be confident that the source we found is actually about the person we're looking for. One reason that's so important in Family Tree is that family tree is magnificent as far as its hinting algorithms. So you know over on the right hand side of a person page, oftentimes you'll see hints for records that might be about that person. But those hints depend on accurate information on the person page. And if we put bad information or incorrect information on the person page, then there's a good chance that it's going to bring up incorrect hints. So we want to be really careful to attach correct hints so that we don't kind of mess up or fool the search algorithm into providing more incorrect hints. Because once you attach an incorrect one, it tends to snowball. Now, I'm not talking about being paranoid, but just being reasonably careful, if that makes sense. The next thing that we want to do in preparation is to determine which records are likely to find the information that we're looking for. Now, some of those are no-brainers, right? 
christening dates are found in christening records. So if you're looking for a christening, look in christening records. Looking for a marriage, look in marriage records. Those are the obvious ones, but there's also some less obvious ones. For instance, I've actually found that military records in multiple countries might contain marriage information because there was a chance that there would be a pension provided to a soldier if he left a wife, if he was killed, either in action or even later on. So the, the record needed to specify uh, someone who would receive the pension. Oftentimes that was a wife, but they had to document the marriage, you know, prove that that woman really was married and really did deserve to get the um, or was qualified to get the the pension of the soldier. Another less obvious one is that in some time periods and countries, death records might contain birth dates or parents' names. Now, not always. Again, it depends on the time period and the country, but that's something to keep in mind if you're looking for a birth date or parents' names might be on a death record. Some de some records are more error prone than others. Two that I've noticed that seem to be particularly error prone are census records and newspaper articles. And I don't know if it's just because it's not really a primary source. You know, the enumerator when he wrote down the, the household in a census might have gotten the information from a neighbor. Newspaper articles in the old days, somebody might read the information to somebody over the phone and they write it down and there could have been mistakes. So if you know that a record is error prone, then you definitely, and you but you know that that's a good place to find information. You also want to confirm that information in other records whenever possible. And then finally, if you're not sure what records are available that might contain the information you want, try the amazing Family Search Wiki. In case you're not familiar with the Wiki, it is not a place to find people, but rather a place to find information about how to find people, including great historical records. So the way you get to the Wiki is click on search and then click on research wiki. And when you do, you get this wonderful search page. It's, it's just front and center here. We've got a map. You can either click on a map area or you can type in something into the search field. So here I was looking for information on searching in Genesee. That's where the Lilly family lived. So you notice when I typed the word Genesee, some matches came up. And as it happened, the first one is the one I wanted because I was searching in Genesee County in New York. So I clicked on that and got this amazing page. There was so much on there, I had to cut part of it out because it wouldn't all fit on the slide. But you can try this search yourself and go to the Genesee page or any page you're interested in and just see these great resources that they list, places where you could find out more information about your ancestors. Okay, those are some preparatory steps to take to have a more successful search. Now let's talk about actually doing the search. In Family Search, there are two ways to search Family Search historical records. One is from the top menu where you click search and then you click records and it takes you to this beautiful search page. The other one that we're not, oh, I forgot I had a tip here. For those of you who use your, who type a lot in your browser address bar, you can type familysearch.org slash search to go directly to this search page. The other one I wanted to mention, we're not going to go into detail on this today, but it's such a, a great feature that I did want to mention it for, your, for everybody's edification. And that is that on anybody's person page, if you click the Family Search logo, that will actually do a search grabbing the information off the page so you don't have to type it in and it will run a search in Family Search historical records. You get to the same place by searching. So if you click this logo or you click the menu and that we just showed on the previous slide and run a search from there, you'll get to this same search results page. So just wanted to give a shout out to this. I love it. And these other logos will search the other sites. I use these all the time. And it's just so cool not to have to type in everything. And another cool thing is once you do run one of these searches, you can actually edit the search very easily on any of the sites. 
But to get back to the main page, that's where we're, going to, where we're going to focus on the next little section. And we're going to touch on four things here. First of all, the search form. Second, finding a collection. Third, searching by place. And finally, we'll just show you the tips for effective searches. So this is the simple search form. What I have found, fair warning, is because it's so general, these search search results tend to be quite a bit less accurate than regular search results, or I guess what I would call regular, with a little bit more information on a more focused search form. Let me give you an example. We're back to our cute friend, John Lilly. I was looking for just any information on him that might be in historical records, whether it was in the United States or whatever, because, you know, remember, we, we think he moved to the United States. So I just put in his birth information, since that's usually the best way to search for somebody. Not always, but usually. And I searched, and this is what I got. Well, the top results show that none of them logically can be for my guy. So this guy died in 32, but he was born in 03. This guy died in 33. He was born in 1766 and on and on. This guy got married in 32. Well, that's the year my guy was born. So he's not going to be getting married in 32, right? And the rest of the results were equally um, wrong, equally not applicable. Now, to be fair, you can, you know, we got 3,000 results here, over 3,000, and probably some of them are for this guy. So you can use these buttons up here to filter, but I'll be honest with you, I find these buttons kind of awkward to use because you have to click it and then you have to make your choice of a few things, then you have to drill down some more if you want more focused results. And I honestly find that it is so much easier and faster just to enter better information when you search rather than try and drill down to find information or to focus information that you actually already had. So how do you use, how do you run a better search with more information? Very, very easy and family search historical records just hit more options. And when you do that, you get this more complete search form. So let's take a look at how this one works, because there are a few more fields on it. It's not as simple as the other one, but it's actually not that much more complicated. And it's a lot more flexible and, in my experience, returns a lot better results. So any item that's in gray, I know this is this may be hard to see as far as the colors, but these items that are outlined in red are in a gray font, and that means they're already expanded. They're already showing. So the name field is open. This kind of helps reveal the problem with the general search, the simple search on the first page, is that this is an any place and date field. So when it searches with any, it searches for a date of any kind of event, whether birth, marriage, death, military, probate, whatever. And a lot of times we really do want a much more focused search than any date and any event. Any items that are blue are closed currently, but you can click them to open them. So suppose I want the birth field open, I just click birth, or I want to specify a father, I just click father. If you see a thing that you don't want, some fields that you don't want, and they're cluttering the form for you, just click the blue X to close it. Pretty simple there. It was worth, some of these are really obvious, right? Uh, birth, marriage, residence, death, but some that aren't so obvious, I wanted to just explain them a little bit. So if you click to open other person, it will let you specify somebody other than the listed family members here who might appear on the record, such as a sibling or possibly a boarder or a servant or a nephew or whatever. That's where you can list somebody that isn't one of these primary family members. Type, kind of what you would expect. It's the type of record, such as a birth, death, or military record. Batch number is an interesting one. It pertains to the old extraction program. I know some of you on the, the call today are familiar with that. For those of you who may not be, this is the precursor to the indexing program. Back in the olden days, before there was indexing, there was extraction, but it was 
basically the same thing where you would look at historical records and you would write down the information to make it searchable for other people. Well, the batches, the, the names were always grouped in batches and every batch was assigned an ID. So if you happen to know the batch number, for instance, sometimes it's listed in various other records. You might have it in your notes or something. So if you find the batch number, you can enter it in the batch number field to narrow your results to just that batch number. The image and film number are very similar. If, and we're actually going to look at an example of this later. So if you happen to have the ID of the, the DG is uh, for digital images and the film is for microfilms, but a lot of them have been digitized too. So anyway, if you have one of these IDs, you can click this one right here and enter that ID. And then finally, principle can be a confusing term sometimes. Very simply defined, it's the person who experienced the event on the record. So on a christening record, it's the person who got christened. The parents on the record or the godparents or the vicar or whoever, they aren't the principal. Only the person who got christened is the principal. On a marriage record, it's the bride and groom, etc. So here are some general tips for using the search form, and then we're going to walk through some typical examples. So what you want to do when you're entering information in a search form is enter the information that is likely to be on the record you're looking for. I can't emphasize that enough. I think it's one of the great secrets of finding the information that you need. So here's a simple example, and we're actually going to be looking at some more later on. But if you're looking for a birth record, it usually doesn't help and could possibly hurt to enter a death date for the simple fact that most most birth records don't include death dates. Now, I, like you I have, I've seen exceptions to that, particularly in the case of stillbirths or a baby that dies soon after. The um, attending physician might make a note on the birth certificate or something, but that's definitely the exception. Most of the time, a death date is not listed on a birth record, so it doesn't help to include it in your search parameters. Usually, you're going to want to enter at least a name and birth information to get the best results. And here, I want to debunk a myth. It's actually not better to enter either more or less information. I've heard people argue both ways on the internet. Some people will say it's much better to enter more, you'll get better results. And others say it's much better to enter less because you'll get more results. The truth is, it depends on your situation. Generally speaking, the more information you put in, the fewer results you'll get, but they'll tend to be more accurate. They'll tend to match the information that you put in. On the other hand, if you put less information in, you'll generally get more results, but they will include less accurate ones because the search was less focused. It had less information. OK, let's walk through these examples, a simple search, a more detailed search, a matching ex expected information search, and a film search. So here's a very simple search. I wanted to find information for my ancestor, Armstrong Simpson. Don't you love that name? And it actually, you would think it might be unique, but they kept using it again and again in their family. So they actually have a number of Armstrong Simpsons. So I found that I have to be careful and pay attention, make sure I don't mix them up. This guy was born in Blackburn and I had found him in some census records. So I knew his birth was approximately between 1807 and 1809 and that's it. Very simple search. One thing to call out is I did close the any information um, section and I expanded the birth section because I specifically wanted to be searching by birth place and birth range. And when I clicked search, I got a lot of good results. I got a christening record that looks really good. The year is right. The place is right. I would need to confirm the parents, but there aren't any other Armstrong Simpsons 
born about that same time, like there might be with a John Smith. So I don't have others that I kind of have to tell apart. This guy's lining up pretty good. And then the census has looked good. In the 51, he's got, he's living in the right place, got the approximate right birth years, same with the other censuses going down. And here's a possible death that I had not known about. So that's something that I can validate and make sure that that's really for my guy, but it's looking good. Right birthplace, right locate, or right birth year, and right location. So this came up with really good focused results just by using the name, the birth date, and the birthplace. Let's look at what happens when you add just a little bit more information. In this case, I wanted to find records that also included the wife, Jane, and that they were birth information records. So I would expect these probably to be records of Armstrong and Jane's kids, because I said I want them both on the record, but I want it to be a type of birth baptism or christening record. And you see, I didn't really add that much more information, just the spouse and the record type, but look what that did for me. Just a few details brings very different results. And these results also look promising. On every record, we've got Armstrong as the dad, See, it says father right here. We've got the spouse named Jane, and we've got these various children. Now, from this record, I don't see any locations, so I don't know for sure. Whoops, sorry, clicked too soon there. Um, I don't know for sure just from these, these entries that these are right, but they're worth checking into, and it will be very easy once I open the record to verify whether these really are for my family. Example number three, this is a great example, another one of how important it is to put information in the search for, form that you expect to be on the record. And I've actually started out here with a counter example just to make a point. So I am trying to find Lillian Pearson's civil birth registration in England. And I know from the census that she was born in a little parish called Barkston in Lincolnshire. And she's her birth year has got to be someplace around 1890 to 91, according to the census. So I want to find this birth registration. I'm going to restrict the record type to births, and I'm going to click search. But look at this. I did not even get any birth registration. I got uh, here looks like a christening. Well, this is a, a baptism, so essentially the same thing. Here we got christening, christening. Um, this looks like a mother record on a child's christening because the child is listed. And if Lillian was single as a Pearson, these married women with the name of Pearson probably aren't my Lillian because she probably didn't marry another Pearson. That does happen, but rarely. So these records, except the first one, the christening of Lillian herself, don't even look like they're about my gal. So what went wrong? Well, for those of you who are familiar with English civil registration, and even if you're not, the problem is that the birthplace name, the parish of Barkston, doesn't match the civil registration place name. And this does tend to happen in other countries besides England. So just to explain, in England, civil registration districts are government administrative areas, and they typically will contain many parishes, and typically they are don't have the same name as most of the parishes under their jurisdiction. And that was the case here. So the registration district was named Newark, but it contained the parish of Barkston and a bunch of other parishes. But when I told Family Search to search for Barkston, it said, yep, I'm searching for Barkston. And it didn't know to search for Newark because how would it? How would it know? These names are just totally different. So let's go back now and look at what happens if I choose the civil registration district. So I choose Newark, and when I start typing Newark and start typing Nottingham, 
then the result comes up and it says civil registration district. And again, this works in other countries besides England. You'll see um, a government registration or, for instance, in Scotland, it's called statutory registration, whatever it's called in the country that you're searching in. You can look for that and then pick the right one. So I picked Newark and clicked search and wow so much better the right result came up at the top so that just shows how important it is to use the information that you expect to be on the record that you're searching in now you might be asking well how did you know that barkston was in newark and that's a really good question if you google a registration district for Barkston, you'll get search results that will let you know what the registration district is for Barkston. I haven't tried that with other countries, but I would guess that that would work very well there. What was interesting is when I Googled it, one of the first results was for the Family Search Wiki. So uh, Googling will help you figure out like what is contained within a certain registration district. Another very common example is if a woman died under her married name, you might not find her death record by searching with her maiden name. Now, sometimes maiden names were put on death certificates, but a lot of times they weren't. So it's just a caution. If you're searching for somebody under a certain name, be sure to use that certain name instead of the birth name, especially, well, particularly if you're not getting good results. So again, the key takeaway is to search using the information most likely to be on the record that you're looking for. Here's example number four, and this is just a fun one. So this is a screenshot of one of my very favorite sites. OPC stands for Online Parish Clerk. So this is a site where they've got a lot of birth marriage or rather christening marriage and burial records taken from Lancashire Parish Registers. Well, a lot of these came from church films, church, films that the church had, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had digitized. So whenever you see LDS films, Films, now it's going to be what we would probably call a family search film. So there's the number of where this baptism came from. Well, I want to see if there's any other Simpsons, if there are any other Simpsons on this film, because most of the time films covered a pretty small geographic area. They were maybe for one large parish or a couple of smaller parishes. So there's a pretty good chance I'm going to find some Simpson relatives here. So I put in the last name of Simpson and I put in, I click image group number or film number to open this up. Then I put the film number from the OPC site and I click search. And look what we got. We got a boatload of family members. This isn't even all of them, but they are from the same parish as Armstrong is from. The um, Leyland, I hope I'm saying that right, Leland, Leyland. But they're all these people, especially with that parish being so small, they've got to all be related. So this is an exciting find for me that I can look at these people and kind of try to put these families together that are all related on my Simpson line. Okay, before we move on to the last section, let's just talk about a couple of other tricks that can help you get more accurate search results. Like many other websites, Family Search will allow exact searching, but it's actually a little bit, um, I don't want to say counterintuitive, but there's an unexpected little trick to it. So first of all, you've got to enable exact searching. The exact searching toggle is only visible if you click the more options button to get this more complete search form. So you have to click more options and then you'll see this and just turn it on if it's blue and the, the bubble is over to the side. Okay, that makes me think. I've actually never tested this in a left to right language. So I probably shouldn't say the bubbles in a certain place because you know how some like Urdu is a language that you read. Did I say left to right? I meant right to left. There's some languages that are read the opposite direction from English and Spanish and so forth. So I actually don't know how that looks on another language. 
But for languages that are read from left to right, the bubble is going to be over here. You, or you want to make sure the bubble is over here to turn on exact search. But that's not all. That doesn't automatically mean that you're now going to do an exact search. You also have to click the checkbox next to every item that you want to be exact. And that's the step that people often miss because they just think, oh, I turned exact searching on. And so now everything should be exact. But it actually isn't unless you click the checkboxes. Notice also that some things don't have an exact checkbox. And that's because by definition, they're already exact. So for instance, if you enter a film number, that already is supposed to be the exact film number. There aren't, you know, variations on a film number or whatever. So no exact check mark there. But things that can have like spelling variations, um, place variations where, you know, nearby parishes or whatever, they have exact checkboxes so that you can restrict the results to exactly whatever you typed there. Okay, the last exciting feature that we wanted to talk about that is very useful in getting the search results that you want is wildcards. What are wildcards? Well, they are placeholders that represent letters in search parameters. So Family Search uses two types of wildcards, and actually these are pretty common on websites. There are some that use different ones, but these are by far the most common. So if you memorize these, these could be useful on a number of other websites. The first one is simply a question mark, and it stands for any one character and only one. The other is an asterisk. This stands for zero to an infinite number of characters. Well, that might sound like gibberish, so let's take a look at some examples. First of all, I wanted to show what Family Search does when you don't do any wildcards, because Family Search search is very smart. It automatically applies fuzzy matching, in other words, broader matching. It's not just going to strictly, by default, find these exact spellings, but it's also going to find similar names. So this example up here, without any wildcards, is going to return Joseph Benton, but it's also going to return, for instance, Mark Joseph Benton. That was one of the results where Joseph is a middle name. And it's also going to return similar surnames like Bentley or Bensley. Those were some that showed up in my search results, too. So that being said, be, we we can just be grateful that Family Search already does a fuzzy search, but sometimes we want a little more control over the results. So I noticed when I was searching for Joseph Benton, like I said, I got those extra names that I really didn't want in this particular search. I knew Bentley was not really a variation on his name. So I wanted to restrict it, but I noticed in the search results that Benton often had a different second to last character. Sometimes it was an E, sometimes it was an O, sometimes it was an A, it just depended. So I wanted to be exact to B, E, N, T, whatever, N, and nothing else. So I use the question wildcard, but I also by, uh, discovered by searching first without exact that when I didn't click exact, let me show you what happened. When I didn't have this on, I got some really like far out search results. In some circumstances, we might want those. But in this circumstance, I didn't. I just wanted B-E-N-T, whatever, N. So when I turned on the exact searching, then I got exactly what I wanted. Oops, I forgot. I, I, I thought I had a show of exactly what I wanted. I apologize, I didn't. But when I turned on exact search results, I didn't get these kind of out there search results. I just got exactly what I wanted. The last one I wanted to illustrate as far as wild cards is using the asterisk. So this example, remember, it's zero to infinity as far as characters. So this example will just return the name bent with nothing after it. 
but it will also include anything that starts with bent, like Benton, Bentley, Bentham, Bentwick, whatever. And so there are a lot of character, a lot of instances where this is useful. Another time it's useful is in the middle of a name. So you could, I could have done like B E star. N, and that would have given me any name that starts with BE with whatever in the middle or nothing in the middle and ends with N. So these wildcards can be very useful in getting exactly the search results that you want. Before we get into the last section, let's just touch, touch very briefly on the other three features available on the home search page. One is find a collection, and this is useful if you know the actual or probable name of a collection. For instance, you want to search for Australia birth registrations. You can also click browse all collections and see a complete list. In this case, I wanted to look for Australia Notice what happened when I started typing the word Australia. It actually gave me a list of matches. And then I could click the match and it would bring me to a screen where I would just be able to search in whatever record collection I had selected. Search by place is a fun and I think underutilized feature on this page. It shows you resources for a certain place, a certain country or a certain area. You can also click browse places to actually get a clickable map. But in this case, what I wanted to do is search for resources for the Netherlands. So I typed in Netherlands and it popped up the matching result. So I clicked Netherlands and look what I got. This totally cool page with various resources for the Netherlands. Guided research, learning sessions to teach me more, references to just regular websites on the web, and even a list of Netherlands indexed, research, uh, indexed records. So this can be a really cool way to just get a great overview of what's available and how to learn more about a certain area. Last one I wanted to point out is if you click on tips for effective searches, you get taken to this page. At the top, it has tips and at the bottom, it has various demos and videos that will teach you more about searching effectively. Okay, let's finish up with using the results. When you have searched for something and you click search and you get your results, the search terms that you have entered now appear in a panel on the right hand side. And as we mentioned earlier, these results can be edited. So you can come back in here, suppose that I said, well, I really don't want to search for a death place in Elba, Genesee. I just want to broaden it to New York. So I can erase Elba, Genesee, Elba, Elba, Genesee, and then click search to repeat the search with that broader area of New York. Anything in here can be edited. Anything can be added. Suppose that I looked on here and I thought, oh, I forgot to do marriage. So then I can click marriage. I can add the marriage information. That's theoretically that I have it already. And then I can click search and that will bring me up. That, that will then include more marriage records in the search results. So it's really nice that once you've got this, once you've run your initial search, you can tweak it to get just the results that you want. You can also, as we mentioned earlier, use these buttons at the top to filter your results. I find the collection filter to be the most helpful. So I'm actually not going to demo the other little options because they're pretty straightforward. But the collection panel might be considered a little more challenging to use, but I find it very powerful. So I think it's worth taking a look at. When you click collection, then the collection panel opens on the right hand side. What it shows is a list of all records that are in 
these search results. So you know that if you go in here and you click some of these checkboxes, it's just going to narrow down these search results. You don't have to worry that, oh, I might click this, but there's nothing for that. No, it's it. This is all stuff that is in these, in this case, these over 1500 search results. What is shown when you first open the collection panel is just the first few in any given type. So I see here uh, the first four in birth, marriage, and death. I click this button if I want to see more, and then I can click any checkbox. So for instance, sometimes when I'm looking for English christenings, I will do a search and maybe the search results are too broad. So I click show all the birth, marriage and death, and then I'll click like English births and christenings, English parish registers, uh, Cambridgeshire parish registers, whatever might be in there that I think is probably going to contain my record. And then you just click apply collection filter and it narrows your search results to whatever you have chosen from the filter by collection panel. A little bit of explanation here. Sometimes the icons are not exactly straightforward or people wonder what they mean. So if you see this pedigree icon, it actually means that the record is attached to somebody already in Family Tree. And if you click that pedigree icon, you can see that. The page icon with the camera means that a, a record is, or excuse me, an image is available, not just the indexed typewritten stuff, but actually Actually, the image that the record was taken from, that the um, typewritten stuff was taken from. Finally, if you click this last one, the paper icon with lines, or you click the name of the person, it takes you to the record detail page. Both take you to the same place. And that place looks like this. So I wanted to point out four cool things on this page. The first one is one that people always ask about. If I see a mistake in this information, so if it was indexed incorrectly, can I fix it? Well, Family Search is, and a lot of you know that on Ancestry you can, and Family Search is rolling out a similar capability. It's not available on all records yet, but it's getting added to more and more as time passes. It is available on the 1870 because this button is blue. If the button were gray, you would know that it wasn't available on that particular record. But to correct a problem, let's say that this birth record, or excuse me, birth year had been misindexed and it was really 1854. Well, then I would click edit. It would give me a form to fill out to say what the correct year was. And it would even let me draw on the image to say where the correct information was. It lets, lets you do a little highlight. So that's what the edit function is for. Over to the side, it will tell you if this particular record is attached to anybody already in Family Tree. And if it is, then you can click the name to go to that person page. Below that, or excuse me, yeah, the, click this to go, okay, let me start again. I said that a little bit mixed up. So if you click the name, you can go to the person page. If you click this icon with the paper clip, it actually opens up this source in the source linker. The source linker is the place where the source was originally attached. So it's that screen where you can see like the information in the source and the information in family trees side by side. So if you click this, it opens that up and you can for instance, if necessary, detach the source or if it's the wrong source, or you can just review what has already been done, like what other family members it's attached to, that type of thing. The last thing is that if Family Search found any similar records, they will be listed below here and they may or may not be attached. In this case, both of them say they are already attached to the guy. But I've seen records listed where they weren't attached. And so that's a great opportunity to review those similar records and see if they need to be attached as a source. So the last thing that I wanted to mention is that Family Search has a really cool capability where you can download search results and then you can download them to a spreadsheet and you can sort them and 
um, analyze them and just so many capabilities that way once you've got them in a spreadsheet if you enjoy that type of thing which I know some of us do and if you don't that's totally fine too some people go why would I want to do that so this may not be useful if you're one of those people but if you're one of the people who says oh yeah I'd really like to get that into a spreadsheet so I can you know sort the columns and organize the information it's beyond the scope of this webinar to go into that detail but uh, recently in a Sunday class at the BYU Family History Library, we had a webinar on that topic that actually walks through step by step how to download the information and how to organize it. So if you're interested, uh, this link right here is active and this is the name of the webinar. You can go to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel and just search for case study using family search historical records and it should come right up. So this brings us to the end of our class today. Thank you so much for coming. By way of summary, we talked about how to get the best search results prepare before you search. Then the search form provides many options to help you get the results that you want. Once you have the results, you can refine them. You can see more detail and you can download those, those results and process them further. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And I am going to go ahead and actually, I promised I would put the link to this presentation in the chat. So let me just grab that really quickly. And put it in. And you know what I just realized? I don't know if I shared this. Let me make sure that it is going to be visible to everybody. Nope, I didn't. Okay, anyone with the link? And now when you click that link, you should be able to get to this slide deck. So that is it for our class today. Olivia, are there any questions? It looks like at around 5.30, Margaret asks, if put both maiden and married last name in the last name field, Will it look for either name or for females? Oh, that is such a good question. I should have added that to the presentation. Let me go back here. The way that you would want to do that, oh, it actually shows on this screen, is you, you don't want to put them, put them both in the same field because that would make the search engine look for that combined name. What you'd want to do is click alternate name and that lets you specify a different name for the person and then family search will do both. So suppose this was Charlotte Lily, but suppose her married name was Charlotte Bescoby. Then I could click alternate name and in addition to Charlotte Lily, then I could put Charlotte Bescoby and it would search for both of those surnames. Fantastic question. Thanks for asking. Oh, and I see someone said, um, can we have the link to the parish, the uh, presentation on parish registers? Yeah, I can grab that really quickly. Let's get over to that page. Whoops, went too far. And I will right click. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I tried to right click and grab the link, but it didn't work. It actually brought up the video. So I'll just grab it that way. And now I will put this in the chat. So this is... Um, Parish Register webinar. There we go. Okay, anything else? Oh, David asks a good question. Fuzzy logic, search, sound decks, what are the relationships and what are the current algorithms? David, it's so interesting that you asked that because I just like probably a month ago, so pretty recently, learned from a, a family search engineer that they are, well, this won't come as a surprise. They're constantly refining these algorithms. So they're constantly shifting. But at this point in time, they consider something upwards of like 100 different data points when they're searching. So these algorithms are extremely refined and getting better all the time. The old sound, so when I said fuzzy search, that was actually my name for whatever family search's current 
algorithm is. And it's, and again, it's changing all the time, improving all the time. Soundex, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is an old system where phonemes or, or, or sounds, so it wasn't letter to letter, but it could be sounds like TH, or it could be a single letter like K or whatever. But as I understand it, sounds were assigned numerical values. And so any name that ended up with the same numerical value was considered to be a close match. Soundex was not perfect. Sometimes you got really off the wall matches. Like on my Bescoby line, Bishop is considered a Soundex match for Bescoby because the numeric code for Bescoby and the numeric code for Bishop turned out to be the same, the numeric Soundex code. So as far as I know, a lot of sites don't use Soundex anymore, although there are a few that do. And so the, there, you just won't get as refined results using Soundex, but it's still, still useful. So let's see. I see Pat and Kimberly said, could you add the link for the timeline grid? Absolutely. That is a great question too. Let me type that in here because th this is an example of where it comes up because it comes up in my browser address bar because I go there so often. So here is the site and I'm throwing the link in the chat right now. Let's see. Oh, I typed timeline grind. That's what I get for typing and talking at the same time. Timeline grid link. There we go. So Olivia, have I, I haven't looked at everything in the chat. Have I missed anything that we should address or were there any Q&As? I don't think so. I think we got all of them. Okay, great. Then I will, I think we're done, Olivia, and I'll turn the time back over to you. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for your presentation. You bet. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on August 17th with Maureen Brady. She will be giving a presentation entitled The Old Northwest, Researching the Great Lakes States. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.